Well, good morning. Welcome from Abbotsbury. This is the end of April, coming into May now, and uh, a lot of flower power in the garden still. We've had uh, camellias and rhododendrons and magnolias flowering right through from February. So we're going to look at some of the plants around the garden today, some more specialised things that are coming out, quite interesting. Um, we've got a lovely backdrop over here. You can see all the rhododendrons in, in the distance still flowering. Mostly rhododendron arboreum from the Himalayas. Um, but right here, we've got a very special plant in flower, or just about to flower, not quite. I'll just show you if I get in closer to it. Right, this, this beast, I've got to be careful here because they've got nasty backwards facing spines on it. It will catch you. Um, this is called Puya chilensis, a native from Chile. And look at that giant flower spike. It's not open yet, but it's just within the next week or two, it'll be open, lovely yellow flowers. Um, and it grows in the arid dry zones of central Chile, up in the, the mountains there. Quite unusual plant, uh, but this clump is about 15 years old and it's taken a long time for it to produce its first flower. And so that's what we're quite pleased to see. Uh, but it's not quite open yet. And when it is open, it's very spectacular. In the wild, birds pollinate it um, and they drink the nectar out of the flowers. Uh, but there is an interesting story behind this plant. I've been stabbed by it already. These have got backward facing barbs on it. And they do say that um, the design of this plant uh, is so that it, it will actually capture small animals. Even sheep have been known to be entangled in it. And they cannot get out of it. And then the poor old creature dies and then it its carcass rots away and provides a nutrient for this plant to live off for the next few years. So it's a bit of a carnivorous beast in many ways. Just coming, almost finishing now. This is a lovely plant, um, Cytisus, or I think they may have even call it Genistus now, but its cultivar name is, is Porlock, Genistus Porlock. Um, and it's a lovely uh, Cytisus, that the original uh, parentage comes from southern Europe, Portugal, Spain, even right into Syria and parts of North Africa. So it has a sort of tendency to be quite tender in some parts, some gardens. And it was bred by a well-known guy called Norman Haddon, who's got a garden in Porlock in Somerset. And hence the name, it's called Porlock. But you can see the bees love it. And it's always a lovely spring flowering shrub. Okay, we're on, we're on the Mediterranean bank here, where everything's been planted on a steep south-facing bank. Excellent drainage, and it's on iron ore, which creates an acid soil. So a lot of plants that like this acidity are proteas from South Africa and Australia. And here's a grevillea from Australia, and beautiful flower. Loving these conditions. And just down here, This is a Leucodendron, Safari Sunset, South African plant. Quite unusual flower heads on that. And um, it's used in the cut flower industry quite a lot all over the world. Um, grown in mass in some places. I know they grow it in Madeira quite a lot as well. But uh, it's doing very well on this bank. It likes these conditions. Just here is another plant from Chile. Um, and this is one of my favorite, Berberis. Um, look at the size of those racemes on there, they're amazing. And it's called Berberis valdiviniana. Um, and I've actually seen it in the wild, which is quite the thing for a gardener, because I've, in 2005, I went on a plant hunting sort of expedition to Chile, where we saw it outside a town called Valdivia. Hence the name, it's called Valdiviana. And it's sort of um, in southern Chile, growing naturally in hedgerows, edges of woods. But for a Berberis, with that main amount of flower power, it's quite impressive. And it will get much bigger than that eventually. It's only a small plant. Mm -hmm. 
Just mentioning in the front of our restaurant here, we've got this wonderful New Zealand plant, um, Cleanthus punceus. Um, spectacular flowers. Uh, it's also called the caca beak. Um, it's called lobster claw. Parrot beak has always common names. But caca beak is the kind of thing they say in Australia because it represents the beak of the famous uh, New Zealand, I should say, not Australia. The New Zealand parrot, the kaka, has a very similar beak. But lovely flowers. There's also a white version out there and a pale pink one as well. Just walked away from the kaka beak over here. Here, another Australian plant here, which we've got is the Acacia pravissima. Which it, actually, most people know it as mimosa. So beautiful flowers all over the top. Lovely backdrop here with azaleas, camellias still going. Um, some of them actually look quite good for two or three months and then they start of course getting the dead flowers on them but um, they will disappear very shortly and keep producing buds so that should go through another month yet. Well, we, as I was saying, we're getting over, going through the period of all the magnolias. Um, a, big, a good bulk of them start quite early here. And these are just slowly finishing now, but this is lovely Solangiana sundew. And it's got a lovely, um, slight pink flush in the base of it. Um, but it's still got, it's been flowering for probably uh, four or five weeks now, so I'm quite pleased that it's still hanging in there. Although the temperatures are starting to pick up a little bit now and soon the petals will be dropping. Right next to it here, this is getting more and more common now. People see these around. It's like a giant euphorbia. But what's special about it? It's euphorbia mellifera. Mellifera Latin describes honey producing. And so its common name is the honey spurge. And the scent is actually overpowering. It's, it's pure honey. It just drifts off from this flower if you get your nose close to it. And the bees and that love it. Um, it's uh, an interesting plant. It comes from Madeira and the Canary Islands. Uh, but it sells seeds around here and produces nice little drifts in the garden. Um, but you have to be very careful what, if you're pruning it because it does have a milky sap in there which can be uh, quite uh, obnoxious to the skin or if you're rubbing your eyes or anything. But doesn't do it justice in terms of what you can smell when you get up close. It's really a sweet. And we can move on actually down this path in a minute. I'm going to show you a rhododendron, which is also incredibly scented. So, so this is rhododendron loderi, King George. And um, you can see the size of these flowers just opening up now. Uh, and this one also produces an amazing scent and it just lingers in the pathway here and you can smell the plant way before you actually get to it. I'm quite pleased that this has actually recovered because we had an enormous limb come off that oak up there, as you can see, been ripped away in the storms and it took half the tree away. But the rhododendron's recovered and it's now looking almost as full as it used to, but only on one side, unfortunately. We looked at, uh, earlier at Berberus veldiviana. This is another plant from the same part of the world in southern Chile. More common, so often seen in garden centres, this one. This is Berberus darwinii. Uh, but still spectacular flower this time of year. Named after Darwin. As you can see, um, these wonderful sculptures are a new addition to the garden and they're really enhancing various places when you come around a corner you suddenly come across them. There's a new one with Alice holding flamingo on the island. And the owl and the pussycat have mysteriously suddenly appeared in this pond. They were in the lily ponds last year but they look super here. Um, and everything's just coming to life now. You can hear the pheasants in the background. We've got the mallard ducks moving in. 
And these are the famous gunnera, which the leaves can get up to three meters in the summer. But this time of year, as they're breaking out, you can see these giant flower spikes. Um, quite unusual, very prehistoric looking. And each one's made of millions of little tiny flowers on, their, on that panicle there. Uh, they are native to Brazil, in the, the mountains of Brazil. And uh, they seem to thrive in this lovely wet bogland, bogland sort of conditions around the edge of the pond. So as the first flush of magnolias is finishing, there are some later ones, and most of the later ones are yellow flowering. And there's one right up here called Yellow Lantern. And in the far distance is a yellow magnolia called Elizabeth that was uh, bred from the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens in New, New York many years ago. This garden obviously comprises of a whole range of plants from all over the world and we've got a lot of bamboo. It just gives you a lovely sort of exotic feel to the place but some species, well, they're very attractive like we've got one here. I think with the lovely ghostly grey stems on this one. And this is called Borinda papyrifera. Beautiful canes on it and it's quite well behaved I would say because it stays in one place but behind us here and all through here there are some species you wouldn't dare put in your back garden because you wouldn't see your back garden again and here we have a team of gardeners trying to control it <laughs> what's happened here with the the bamboo within the garden has started to to run and you can see it forming great drifts, even outside in the woodland here. So we're just going to keep it under control by cutting it all back through here. So this is, um, at the bottom end of the garden now, we have what we call the John Bond collection here, with lots of large leaf rhododendrons. Uh, this one here is actually not, the flowers are looking good. The leaves should be twice as big as that really, because it's meant to sign a grandi. But I guess it will get bigger on a wetter summer and get more moisture in the ground. But still looking very spectacular. And behind me is Pyrrhus japonica forest flame. A lot of people know this, um, Quite a common plant in, in gardens, makes a lovely spring appearance. But you see, people think you're buying it for this flower. This is not the flower, this is just a lovely coppery red new growth. So you get a double whammy with this plant. You've got this fantastic new growth on it, and you also get the flowers which are there. You see the white flowers. We're in the Himalayan glade and there's lots of uh, plants of interest and that big large leaf glossy tree up there with big shiny leaves is actually Eriobotria japonica, um, more commonly known as, as the loquat tree. Um, in parts of Japan they maybe have 20 or 30 different cultivars, they're bred constantly to produce a little orange fruit that you buy in the marketplace. This one very rarely fruits because it doesn't get enough sunshine, I don't think. But we grow it for its ornamental value. And just around the corner, there's another one I'd like to show you. It's got fantastic coppery growth. So this is a young Aerobotria called Aerobotria deflexa. And look at that lovely growth as it's coming out, the new growth from the spring here. Um, they can be a bit temperamental, I'm not sure. This one's coming through the winters to the last three years now, so it's should be okay now, but maybe up north it might not survive. Yeah. 
looking at spring colour again, more shrubs. This is a small leafed rhododendron, but lovely flower power. Augustinioi, um, native to Yunnan and Eden and parts of southern Tibet, all around that part, the Himalayas, where it will grow in massive drifts. But this is looking really lovely this time of year. Um, and it complements the bigger flowering ones which are up above it. Here we've got um, Exocorda macrantha, the bride. Always a good regular for lovely spring blossom, almost like apple blossom. So this, this being the Himalayan glade, we have all sorts of trees and shrubs from the Himalayas. But here, here's a native plant most people will associate of the herbaceous borders, Euphorbia fireglow or Griffithii fireglow. But here we've let it run in, a, in amongst the flora here and it combines nicely with our native bluebells. Um, just that lovely colour as it comes through in the spring. Of course, this is how it would grow in the wild. It wouldn't, wouldn't be in a nice, neat clump in a herbaceous board. It would be spreading like crazy. So here we can give it space. Griffith, any relation to you? I'd like to think it was. <laughs> there is actually a botanist. There was a botanist, William Griffith, who um, worked out of Calcutta in about 1790 or so. He was a famous botanist. And there are a lot of plants named Griffith, in around this, in the garden. I collected a few myself. May well be a long distance relative, I don't know, but uh, quite interesting collect collection from that part of the world. A lot of people ask us what these plants are, and we, we're actually putting more and more of these. This is a, it's a species tulip that grows parts of the Himalayas and places like China. So we, this one's called um, Tulip uh, Bakeri Lilac Wonder. And it's slowly starting to naturalise as we put more and more clumps in. It comes up every year, so it's quite a nice a bit of patch of colour this in the spring when you walk around the edge of the garden here. So uh, here we are, this is what we call the Magnolia Walk. This was planned in around 2005, planted about 2006. Um, this was just woodland at one time. And one of the things we identified with the garden was the fact that the garden's been here 250 years. And you can hear the sea in the winter roaring way off the beach. You can almost smell the salt in the wind, but you could never see it. And I knew that if you walked up through here, it's one of the most spectacular views of the Jurassic coast. So to make it, a nice walk. We opened it up and made an avenue of magnolias, spring colours, daffodils, snowdrops, which are actually going over now, but you can get the feel for it. And a lot of visitors are never aware of what's just over the top there. And I think we also just go up and just show people what's there because it's quite spectacular. Hazy today, unfortunately. So this is the, the viewpoint. A little bit hazy to look at today, but to our left you can see Portland and Portland Bill, the whole of the fleet, and just below us is the swannery. You can just about make out the swans on in the distance there. A um, lot of history here going back from shipwrecks to smuggling days and to the Second World War defences that filled throughout this part of the land here. You can still see remnants of the tank teeth, concrete blocks that were put across the beach to stop any potential invasion. But the interesting thing, so we swing to our right, is the, on that little brow on the hill there, where the trees are, is where the ancestral family home was at one time the Abbotsbury uh, Castle it was known as. The Ilchester Estates, Ilchester family, had a property there. And that's the reason why Abbotsbury Garden started, because they found it very windy and exposed on that site there. So they chose a little hollow in the valley just up the road here to grow fruit and vegetable for the castle down here. 
and that's the, the start of Abbotsbury Subtropical Gardens. It was a kitchen garden providing fruit and veg for the house which once stood there. Unfortunately that burnt down in 1913 in a big fire and was never rebuilt properly again so um, no longer there. But the garden survived which is amazing and it expanded from kitchen garden to botanical collection uh, ever since and it's kept on growing uh, for the last hundred years or so. We been adding and adding plants from all over the world using this fantastic microclimate which is because of this, the sea. The sea warms the land in one or two degrees in the winter keeps us just that bit warmer. Uh, we're also in a rain shadow the clouds come in off the sea to condense into rain on the high land behind us um, which gives us more average hours of sunshine on this part of the coast. It gives us a long growing season for the plants to harden off and get ripe for the following winter. And then we've got lots of evergreen oaks, Quercus ilex in the garden, which trap warm air and stop radiation frost coming into the garden. So we are quite blessed with a very special microclimate. So here's the view back down into the garden. Spectacular backdrop as well. Uh, and you can see the magnolias from here. Um, and I hope that's given you an insight of what the garden's like at this time of year. Remember, it's the end of April, just coming into May, um, and each month it's constantly changing. One lot of plants come out into flower, another lot finish. So there's always something of interest throughout the year now. And uh, come back and see what's happening in another couple of months. There'll be a lot more flower power to follow. Thank you.